and I'm delighted one of the speakers is from Aberdeen, which happens to be where next year's meeting is at uh, for the Society of Back Pain Research. So do think about coming to that. Um, David's going to introduce the, 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 the context for the session. Great. Thank you for, for sticking around. Uh, throughout Britspine, I think we've seen a lot of uncertainty around, around clinical interventions. And I'm really delighted to present to you two really high-profile speakers, definitely one of the highlights of the program, uh, who look at assessing interventions from different aspects and, and are making inroads in, in methodological areas here. In particular, um, around placebo-controlled surgery trials and also in the use of registry data. And here we've got Gary McFarlane, who um, will present a little bit of an outside view on the, on the registry field, so nothing from low back pain specifically. Um, the format will be 20 minutes each, more or less, and we'll probably run into the lunch break a little bit because we've just overrun. So stick around for questions and answers. Um, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Manuela Ferreira first. She's Principal Research Fellow and NHMRC Investigator Fellow at the Collin Institute of the University of Sydney. Thank you for coming all the way here. Um, she also leads the clinical back pain research team there and runs multiple sham control or multiple surgical trials. And I'm, I'm also going to save the pause, introduce Gary at this stage. Professor Gary McFarlane is the Dean for Interdisciplinary Research and Research Impacts, Chair in Epidemiology at the University of Aberdeen, and is the co-director of many um, tasks. He has the co-director of versus arthritis in the MRC Council Centre for MSK Health and Work. So Manuel is up first and then Gary. Thank you very much, um, and thank you all for um, coming. Um, again, my name is Manuela Ferreira. I really like how you pronounce it, by the way, David. Um, my name is Manuela Ferreira. I'm a researcher from um, Sydney. A pleasure to be here. My first time in Glasgow, second time in Scotland. Really like it here. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the work that I do in placebo trials of surgery with a, with a focus on back pain. So for those of you who haven't been to Sydney, this is a beautiful photo of Sydney. Um, the highlighted area is where Sydney University is, so I work at Sydney University. But I'm actually on the north side, other side of the bridge, um, at the Colling Institute, um, which is an, a research institute next to Royal North Shore Hospital, where I work with um, clinicians and um, patients and researchers. So first, um, why do we need trials, or do we need trials in, um, in the surgical field? Um, I would argue yes, and um, one of the main reasons being we actually lack trial evidence. Um, most, if you look at the literature, most of the evidence that we have now, until recently, um, were actually coming from retrospective um, case series. And we'll talk about a little bit why this is the case. So um, RCTs are less than 10%. Of the evidence, um, and, and this is not back surgery. This is in the surgical field um, collectively. And um, if you look at um, some of the procedures, more um, now talking about orthopedic procedures, um, about 20% of the, um, of those procedures actually have some support from high quality trials. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons that we'll see is because conducting surgical trials is actually quite challenging. There are a number of different um, and possible designs, as we all know. So you can choose to um, conduct a trial looking at surgery versus conservative care, um, compare different types of um, surgical procedures, or you can actually select a no treatment, sham control, or placebo control. If you look at the literature, most of the existing trials in surgery, um, collectively again, are actually number one and number two designs. Sorry, number one and number three designs. So conservative, comparing surgery to conservative care or different types of surgical procedures. And again, irrespective of the design that you choose, conducting trials of surgery is challenging. And we'll look at some of the common limitations. Again, these are limitations and methodological um, aspects, I would say, of any type of um, clinical trial, but they are a little bit more accentuated in surgical trials. And again, we'll talk about why. So number one is lack of equipoise. And we like comparing um, lack of equipoise as plain, I don't know how many of you play soccer. I'm originally from Brazil. We are crazy about soccer. 
So lack of equipoise is like playing soccer on a field like this. So you have one side of the field or one team that is clearly in advantage compared to the other one. When you look at some of the um, um, elective surgical procedures that we have in trials, especially the spinal ones, and again, now I'm talking about the elective um, surgical procedures, most of those procedures will actually be offered to patients after a course of conservative care. And we, we had a little bit of that discussion yesterday with, a, with an upcoming trial of fusion. So when most of um, patients actually experience conservative care and fail to improve, if they come into a trial that will actually offer to them either surgery or conservative care, you can see how their past experience and perceptions of one versus the other intervention will um, dictate whether or not they want to participate. So when you look at the literature, about four in every five surgical trials lack equipoise, and that has a huge impact on recruitment. That also has a very important and um, um, huge impact on what we call treatment crossover, and this is when you have the, for example, conservative versus surgical care in a clinical trial, and you have patients who choose to have the other um, uh, procedure, not the one they have been allocated to. When you look at the literature, up to 50% of surgical trials um, in musculoskeletal health and other fields actually have a very um, high crossover rate. And um, some people might argue that this is a pragmatic way of looking at um, interventions because, you know, patients can actually choose whether or not they want to have surgery or whether or not they want to have physiotherapy. But we do know that high crossover rates will attenuate decreased treatment effects. So in the end of what you look at the trial, when you look at the trial results, it might not necessarily um, um, replicate or um, indicate the true effect of one or the other intervention. And lack of blinding, again, not a typical methodological limitation of surgical trials, but very um, true and very present in a number of um, surgical trials. So this study was done in 2007, and um, what they found was um, not only um, reporting of treatment allocation, but blinding of patients, um, ward staff, and clinical outcome assessors were lacking in most trials of um, surgery. Now, what's the problem when we don't have blinding, especially of um, outcome assessors and patients? that um, is actually associated with larger treatment effects and is very, very well related, very closely related with lack of equipoise and high crossover rates. So we've gone around the loop. So we need to choose the right design and the right control. Now, there are some very clever designs out there, um, and these are just some examples of um, trials conducted in the UK knee surgical trials, so not back, but there are some very clever and different designs that can be used um, to try and minimize the impact of crossovers, for example, or um, slow recruitment or lack of equipoise. So one of them being the uh, adaptive approaches and the other one being the um, expertise-based design where you actually get pairs of surgeons um, who are more comfortable with one procedure over the other and they work in pairs and, and uh, participants are allocated to one or the other surgeon. But as you can see, it doesn't work for every type of design or control that you choose. And it doesn't deal with the lack of blinding. So again, if you look at the possible designs, there is one design that actually addresses most of these um, limitations, and that is the placebo control trial of surgery. When do we need a placebo control trial of surgery? Well, arguably, where a placebo effect is expected, a placebo control is required, and that's not only for surgery, that's for any intervention. Um, and what is placebo surgery? So, Placebo surgery is a surgical intervention with little benefit. There are some people who will actually make the distinction between sham surgery and placebo surgery, where sham surgery is, for example, just an incision. And placebo surgical intervention is the exact same intervention, but you just omit 
the active ingredient, that one part of the procedure that you believe is responsible for the patient outcome. And we'll give you an example in no time. Now, is it ethical? Yes, it is. And um, having said that, it's not the right design for any research question or for any um, surgical procedure. You have to um, make sure that this is the right design according to the question that you have. And um, in 2002, um, these two authors actually um, published this framework to guide researchers and clinicians into deciding whether or not a placebo-controlled trial was ethical um, and appropriate. And what they highlight is if your question cannot be answered with any of those designs that we um, highlighted before, and if the risks are likely to be the same across placebo and, in this case, surgery, in other words, there is no higher or extra risk for participants in the placebo um, arm, then it is ethical to conduct a placebo controlled trial of surgery. And they are, they exist. Um, there are quite a few of them. Um, these are just some examples of placebo controlled trials of um, musculoskeletal surgery. This is a systematic review done in 2014. It's, it's an older review, it's been updated recently. But these are just some of, of the examples of um, trials that have been done in um, placebo controlled trials of surgery in musculoskeletal health. In back pain, there are quite a few. So there are the vertebroplasty trials, there are three up to now, actually four. Um, there is a pausa trial, and um, there is success. How do you design placebo surgery? Again, harms must be minimized. So that's what you have in mind when you design the placebo, the placebo intervention per se. You need to consider the harms need to be minimized and um, the risk of surgery must be outweighed by the value of the knowledge generated. So just to wrap up, um, this is one example of a placebo controlled trial of spine surgery. Success. So success is surgery for spinal stenosis. Um, it's a trial that we are conducting in Australia at the moment. Um, we have um, colleagues from the UK who are also involved in this trial and are um, investigators on this trial. So we are actually recruiting participants with central canal stenosis, so neurogenic claudication, and they are randomized to either decompression, one or two levels, or placebo decompression. Placebo decompression, and um, just before you, you um, asked me, it was designed by the surgeons. So placebo decompression is exactly the same procedure, but there is no removal of the bone, so the lamina is not removed. Patients are actually um, randomized in theater. So when they are in theater, the anesthetist will call the randomization um, um, center. And then if they're randomized to placebo, there is no removal of the bone. If um, they're randomized to decompression, there is removal of the bone. Everything else, the incision, muscle dissect, everything else is exactly the same, including the time they spend in theater. We then follow them up at three, six, nine, 12, and 24 months. Very challenging. I'm not gonna tell you that it's an easy one. It's very challenging. We started recruitment just before COVID and we had to stop four times because of COVID. And there are many different challenges. So for example, designing the placebo to ensure that everyone was blinded, everyone outside the theater must be blinded. That's why we randomize them in theater because everyone else needs to be blinded, including um, the finance department at the hospital, because in Australia I need to cover the placebo costs, but I cannot cover the surgical costs because they are already covered by the, the government. So um, everything needed to be discussed and put in place. It took us two years to set it up. Um, the time of randomization we talked about, and possibly one of the most um, important aspects is surgeon equipoise. For a trial like this, we should not expect community equipoise. You cannot expect that everyone will agree with it. But you need to have a number that is large enough of surgeons who understand the question and are behind the surgery, um, behind the trial. And we do have um, about 15 surgeons who are on board now. 
Recruitment, of course, was another challenge, and um, we've done quite a few um, side st studies looking at, um, from a participant's point of view, what are the barriers um, to actually agree to participate in a trial like success, and um, these were some of the barriers that they raised in, in general. It's the lack of understanding, and I don't blame them. You know, I think it's overall lack of understanding what is placebo surgery. So um, to overcome that, we have actually developed a couple of um, videos explaining exactly what happens in the, in the trial, and they watch the video before they decide to talk to us. This is, I'm really sorry if I went um, over time, um, but this is just again an example. We have other trials, FinDisc is discectomy versus sham for um, sciatica. We are also conducting that one. Um, and there are a couple of other trials that we are doing in this field, but this is just an example. Um, and thank you very much and very happy to answer questions at the end. Uh, I've got to say I'm a bit sad there aren't more surgeons in the, in the room, but I hope there are a couple of surgeons in the room. Professor McFarlane. So now we're moving to the other end, and we know, we know again in, in, in spinal care we've got a big surgical uh, registry, um, and Gary's going to talk about some of the methodological challenges and limitations and claims we can talk about with registry data. Thank you very much for the invitation to come, and as Stephen says, I hope that many of you will come to Aberdeen um, uh, next year, particularly if you haven't been there before, but it's always a pleasure to come to Glasgow, uh, which, is, which is my home city. So, um, as part of my work as an epidemiologist, I lead national registers in ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and we are just starting the UK antimicrobial registry, uh, examining the effectiveness of new antimicrobial agents. So I'm going to talk about using real world data. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Or as one might say, confounding bias and paradoxes. So we've had a great lecture from Manuela there talking about trials and when should we undertake a trial. Well, we need a hypothesis which is testable. There needs to be some theoretical basis in relation to the mechanisms, perhaps from observational data or previous trial data. Manuela talked about equipoise and the, the importance uh, of that. But of course, you have to have something that is suitable and ethical and practical for randomization. And one of the issues is that even if you have that, it is quite time consuming, as we learned, about conducting trials. If you and I were to have a conversation over lunch and come up with a great idea for a new trial, it would take us a couple of years to get funding, it would take us three, four, five years to do the trial, and perhaps another um, year to report the results. So in about 10 years' time, if we come back, we'll have the answer. And of course, we can't always wait that amount of time um, to get the uh, to get the results. So an alternative is to think about what pharma companies often call real-world evidence, we just call observational data, and could that provide complementary um, approaches to looking at effectiveness? Well, it offers some potential gains. You can have larger samples than are available in trials often. You can have heterogeneous populations that reflect the people that you are seeing in clinical practice. There's scope for longer follow-up than is often available in trials, which can mean that safety um, can be addressed. And of course, a trial will nearly always just answer one question. Well, here you could investigate multiple management strategies, either individually or look at the combination of these strategies. Now, I've got here drug exposure, but it can be surgical intervention. The intervention can be what you, what you want it to be. And what you're interested in is whether that intervention then changes the health uh, status. But the problem, of course, in observational data, that that is likely to be confounded. The decision on whether you give someone an intervention will be affected by their health status and your perception about the, the likely outcome. And this is what we call confounding by indication. <clears throat> 
So let me just give you a really simple example here where you have two treatments, A and B, and you are interested in the risk of death associated with these treatments. And you can see here that people getting treatment A are more than twice as likely to die as people getting treatment B. But let's say that you're interested in looking at it now with respect to severity, the same data, and you say, well, is that true in, in patients with severe disease and benign disease? So you split the data up and look at it according to a disease severity. And when you look at it with respect to disease severity, the answer is completely the opposite. In fact, for both people with severe disease and benign disease, treatment A is associated with only half the risk of death. And why is that? Well, it's, that's because people with severe disease are getting uh, treatment A, and people with severe disease are more likely to die. So if you had only looked at the headline data from your observational study, you would have come up with the wrong result. So here's a clinical example around that. Someone may have a risk factor for gastrointest uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, so they're predisposed to have gastrointestinal bleeding. But that also may result in different management. They may be prescribed a, a COX-2 inhibitor. And if that's the case, you would then see an association between getting a COX-2 inhibitor and getting a gastrointestinal bleeding. But it's not causal. It's because of the patients who you're choosing to give that intervention to. So how do we control this confounding by indication? Well, there are, there are various possible ways we can try to address it. The only way to get around it is by randomization. So in observational data, you're going to have to take approaches that try to address this lack of randomization. Instead of looking at people who get a treatment versus people who don't get a treatment, uh, you could look at groups that get different treatments. So pe uh, patients are thought to require treatment, but some are given one treatment and some are given the other. You could also look at people who are untreated candidates for treatment, looking at the clinical characteristics of the patients. They look as if they're eligible for a treatment, but they don't get the treatment. So why not compare them with people who actually got the treatment? So we can use some methods such as adjustment and regression models, or another way that's popular is propensity score analysis. So what you're doing in propensity score analysis, you're saying based on the characteristics of a patient, how likely are they to get this particular intervention? But the issue is in your observational data set or your registry, do you have all the information that's informing this? The clinical factors, the patient factors, the clinician factors, all of these are likely to be important. And what you're hoping is that amongst patients with a set of characteristics, with a given propensity score, that some will have received the treatment and some will not have received the treatment. And the propensity score matching then allows the comparison of outcomes in those who did get the treatment and those who didn't, amongst patients who had similar propensity to receive the treatment. Of course, you are relying on there being that variability. If it's the case that everybody who has a certain characteristics gets the treatment and vice versa, then you aren't able to use this. For this reason, it's often called pseudo-randomization, but it's not randomization. You're just trying to uh, get around some of the issues inherent in the observational data. Here's an example from JAMA in 2020, looking at the association between surgical approach and major surgical complications in patients undergoing total hip arthroplasty. So here there's been debate about what is the preferred approach for total hip arthroplasty. The anterior approach is theoretically thought to, to reduce the risk of complications. However, on the other side, there have been higher rates of complications reported. So this study addressed the question, what is the association between the surgical approach and complications amongst adults undergoing a total hip arthroplasty? It was a population-based retrospective cohort study, lots of patients, 6,000 in Ontario, Canada, who underwent total hip arthroplasty between 2015 and 18. 
patients were followed up for one year, you can see 10% of patients got the anterior approach, and the outcome was the presence of a major surgical complication at one year. Patients who underwent the anterior approach, they were younger, they were more likely to be male, they were higher socioeconomic status, they were less likely to have comorbidities, and they were more likely to have had their procedure in a hospital and with a surgeon with higher volumes. So all other things being equal, we would expect these people to do better than patients who had got um, uh, other approaches, the lateral or posterior approach. If you just look at the crude data before propensity score matching, patients who had undergone the anterior approach in fact had a significantly greater risk of a major surgical complication with one year. It was 2% in the anterior group compared to 1.5% in the other group. So an absolute risk dif difference of half a percent and a hazard ratio of 1.41. But when you actually undertook the propensity score matching and compared like with like, you see actually the observational data would underestimate the increased risk with the anterior approach. Remember, these patients were at low risk of complications. So now there is a 2% versus 1% difference. So the absolute risk difference is 1% and the hazard ratio is twofold. So in terms of propensity score methods, the use of propensity score methods does rely on having data which accurately predicts treatment assignment. It relies on there being some variability amongst people with the same propensity. And you should be thinking, well, why was there that, that variability? But you can also evaluate the robustness of the results to data you haven't collected. If you find an effect and you're worried about data that's missing, you can ask yourself, well, are there important things that I haven't collected? And are they associated with treatment decisions and outcomes so strongly that they could invalidate the results? One of the ways that we're moving towards an observational study is to do what we call target trial emulation. And that's to apply the principles of trial design that you heard from Manuela to your analysis of observational data. So before you undertake your analysis, you think in your mind about what trial you would have wanted to do if you could have done. And you try to mimic the eligibility criteria, the treatment strategies, the treatment assignment, the follow-up period, and the outcomes measured. Again, you are relying on your registry or your observational data having all the information available. Let's now move on to, to think about some biases that you might encounter. And the first one is immortal time bias in observational studies. So immortal time bias was first described um, amongst uh, people analyzing data on the effectiveness of cardiac transplants. So amongst patients who were eligible, they compared people who got patients who got a cardiac transplant with those who didn't. But actually, they overestimated the effect of the benefit of the cardiac transplant. It was beneficial, but they overestimated the effect. And why did they do that? Well, it's because of the misclassified immortal time. So if you imagine you have an exposed group, and here it could either be people getting a drug or having a cardiac transplant, and an unexposed group, people who ultimately didn't. Well, if you look at the diagram here and think about a person uh, with cardiac disease who, say, ultimately got the cardiac transplant, it is actually impossible to die within this period. You have to be alive in order to get the cardiac transplant. And if you're not alive, then by definition, you're in the unexposed group. So you are building in a bias to the data uh, analysis. So a mortal type bias applies to a time window when neither death nor the study outcome can occur. It most often occurs where groups are compared based on an exposure which is unknown at the start of follow-up. So let me give you some examples. Thinking again about total hip arthroplasty, comparison of mortality in patients who underwent multiple revisions. Well, 
of course, you have to remain alive in order to have the multiple revisions. And if you die before you have the second revision, you aren't in the multiple revision group. The same is true of evaluating of a drug to prevent revision surgery. You have to um, not have the revision surgery in order to be able to get the drug to prevent it. So you, you build in a bias. Now you may think, well surely this is obvious to people that are analysing data. There was a paper published now, I think six years ago, which did a review of the literature for one year and found 23 published studies that had forgotten about immortal time bias and had mis you know, misestimated uh, whatever effects they were calculating. Um, sometimes, so, th so this is the immortal time bias as I've outlined uh, in the previous slide and you don't want immortal time, but also just to say neither is it the correct thing to do to completely ignore that time. Because then in the exposed group, you're starting to follow them up in time much later than the unexposed group. The correct approach is that people are followed up over time and contribute follow-up according to their status at that time. So if you're not exposed at a point, you contribute follow-up time to the unexposed group. But then if you have whatever exposure you're interested in, say it's a total hypothropasty, you then flip over to the exposed group and you start having follow-up from uh, heads forth. The last thing I'm going to tease you with is some paradoxes. And it's about predicting outcome. Because clinical people like to predict outcome. You like to understand what are the factors that predict um, good or bad outcomes. And such data can be used to identify patients who have a high risk of a poor outcome. You might give them different management. Or they have risk factors for a poor outcome that you can then hope to intervene and change. So let me just give you an example of a couple of paradoxes. Obesity is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but amongst people with cardiovascular disease, many studies have found that obesity is protective for mortality. Another one that caused epidemiologists to scratch their heads, infants born to smokers have a higher risk of low birth weight and infant mortality, that is known. But amongst low birth weight infants, parental smoking is protective for uh, mortality. So why is that? Well, we think it's due to something called, or partly, collider stratification bias. And when does that happen? Well, that happens when you have two factors that are both influencing a third factor. So factor A influences factor C, and factor B influences factor C. If in your analysis you condition on factor C, or sometimes called adjust for factor C, you can then induce a spurious relationship between factor A and factor B that doesn't actually exist. Let, let me explain this another way. Let's imagine that we have two coins, coin one and two, and we toss them, and if either of them are head or both of them are head, the bell rings. There is no association between the outcome of the toss in coin one and coin two. But let's now assume that we condition on the bell ringing. So we've adjusted for that and we're conditioning that the bell has run. Well, if coin one is ahead, that doesn't give us any information on what coin two is. But if coin one was a tail, we now know that coin two must be ahead. So once we condition on the bell ringing, there is a relationship between the outcome of these two coins that actually doesn't exist. There has been a considerable amount of work uh, being done and is ongoing to understand this. I just give you some examples from orthopedics and rheumatology. Smoking and the risk of cardiovascular events in NRA. It appears that smoking appears to be protective for cardiovascular events in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Amongst patients, smoking is a risk factor for psoriasis, but amongst patients with psoriasis, smoking appears to protect for psoriatic arthritis. And obesity and the risk of disease progression in NEOA. Obesity is a risk factor, but amongst patients with NEOA, many studies have found that obesity is protective. And let me give you an example from 
from COVID. There was a large study published which showed that amongst patients with COVID that were admitted to hospital, smoking was protective for outcome. And lots of armchair epidemiologists, because we all became armchair epidemiologists during COVID, thought, that's strange. How, how, does, how did that happen? But this was an example. We were conditioning on having COVID and being admitted to hospital. And if you were admitted to hospital with COVID, then amongst all the things that you could have that got, got you there, smoking was a relatively good reason, rather than having serious other morbidities. So again, many people thought, wow, smoking is protective. Smoking was not protective for outcome, but relative to other factors that could have caused you to be in hospital with COVID, smoking was a relatively good um, factor to, to have. So in terms of predicting outcome using real world data, identifying risk factors for outcome in specific population groups is a major use of real world data. But identifying and the correct quantification of risks factors predicting outcome is very important designing management strategies. So let's imagine you're thinking about the, the people with knee osteoarthritis. Why is it that obesity may appear to be protective? Well, it could be that of the various reasons that cause you to have osteoarthritis, relatively speaking, obesity uh, isn't, as a, uh, you know, isn't as poor a predictor of outcome as the others. But does that mean that we don't have to worry about weight management? Absolutely not. Patients reduce their weight, they will have a better outcome. In terms of addressing this issue, it requires proper causal inference methods. It requires you to draw etiological maps of how you think each of the factors are functioning and tailor your analysis according uh, to that. So I hope that's given you some insight to the use of real world evidence. It does offer fantastic opportunities to answer questions that either can't be answered by trials or would have to wait a long time for. But I hope I've also shown you that there are plenty traps waiting for the unwary in the analysis of such data. Thank you very much for your attention. G Gar Gary, may I ask you to stay there, Manuela? Would you like to join us up, up here? Um, do take a microphone. Oh, look, it's nearly lunchtime. <laughs> Gary's paradoxes have baffled all. <laughs> Gary, just one whilst, whilst Val's taking the microphone, just a, a question. We know that attribution bias is a problem in trials. We know that. It seems to me, I haven't looked at the spine registry data. Maybe someone here knows. But last thing I was looking at, they kind of only were managing kind of 30 40% follow-up. So I was just wondering about kind of what impact that has on real-world data, registry yeah. data. Yeah, so, so that's a good point. I, I didn't touch upon missing data at all, and I can guarantee that when you run registries, missing data is an enormous headache. Sometimes data is missing by design, other times it's not missing by design. And there has to be a very careful evaluation of the patterns of missing data. And... Um, so normally, if you just ignore it and just do a complete case analysis, you will have a biased analysis. So normally, you would be looking to do some type of imputation. And that is predict what a missing value would be based on some other characteristics. So for example, if, if someone was a heavy smoker, but the alcohol data was missing, then all the data in the data set might tell you that they are likely to be uh, a moderate or heavy alcohol consumer. So now that's a very important point as well. But the best solution is not to have the missing data in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just a quick question for Manuela. I was interested in the, the spine study that you gave the example of where they did a placebo surgery and they did everything apart from taking the, the lamina away. And you said the operating time was the same. And I, I don't know the surgical technique. So what because obviously there must be a certain amount of time needed to do the laminectomy. So in the placebo uh, surgery, 
what happened in the theatre? Did they just stand there, or I was thinking, what you know, what what was going on? Were they just singing a tune, or? <laughs> it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, they do stay in there. So um, what happens is um, randomization happens just before the removal of the bone. So the first part of the surgical procedure is the same. It happens. So there is a scission, you know, skin, yeah. muscles, everything. When and it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. They know it's going to happen. Um, so when the surgeon is about to remove the bone, that's when the anesthetist will randomize a patient. So the difference between the two procedures wouldn't be, in terms of time, it wouldn't be huge anyway, but they do stay there. Um, probably the placebo stays there probably about 10 extra minutes um, just to, to compensate for the for the time otherwise the nurses outside theater will know oh there's a placebo coming out because um, the, the time is different and obviously all the theater staff would know what operation was being done so yes yeah. they're the only ones but they're nobody the, else nobody does. else yeah. okay. no I was just interested in what they did in that time yeah <laughs> <laughs> listen to music on the same subject, forgive me. So is the world full of more altruistic people than we believe? Are there really people that will take the risk of death under an anaesthetic to advance medical science, knowing that the only possible benefit will be the placebo benefit? Yes, absolutely. And if you ask patients who are, so we have actually a video of um, participants who have finished the trial and they will share the experience. Um, and you know, some of them were in the placebo, and this is one of the main reasons why people participate in, in trials, not only placebo trials of surgery, but trials in general, because of science. Now, to your point um, on the risk of death, one very important aspect when we were designing the placebo was actually making sure that the placebo surgery did not offer any additional risk. So that risk of death exists with both groups, not only the placebo. Of course. But yes, absolutely. Um, it's all for science. And, and, and presumably the surgeon did sort of poke around at the nerve to make, give them the same risk of nerve root injury despite the fact that he wasn't doing any good. Um, so, so they do exactly what they would do mm. with, the, with the procedure. Thank I don't know much. if you're amazed, you're shaking your head, I don't know if you're, <laughs> you're amazed in, in, in the nature of human benevolence <laughs> or amazed at the whole notion of it, but <laughs> maybe afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much both for your presentations, they were very good. The, the question is for Professor McFarlane. If one wanted to start a registry, what would be the ideal team? Who would be sitting on that team? Okay, um, so uh, the first thing I'm going to say before I come to the team is you have to be really clear what you want from your registry. There is sometimes a feeling that reg a registry can be all things to all persons and can answer any questions that you could possibly have. Definitely not. You have to have clear questions in mind or the type of questions in order to influence the design of your registry. So you definitely need methodologists because you want to get the design right. And actually in Aberdeen, we work with our clinical trials unit. Uh, our clinical trials unit does, you know, uh, is involved in placebo-controlled uh, uh, surgical trials, but they're also, they have great expertise for running, uh, for running registries um, as well. So, so methodologists, you need um, groups of clinicians uh, interested groups of clinicians because you're interested in the example questions you can answer and you're also interested in the practicalities of getting people into the registries of the data collection, of the follow-up data collection to make sure can we really ask them to um, uh, collect this. You definitely need an analyst uh, as part of the team and you'll definitely want patient partners involved as well because you want to design things in a way that patients have been involved and had an opportunity to, to influence it. But most of all in terms of um, when I run registries now, I need an expert team of um, study coordinators because our trials take place, uh, sorry, our uh, registries take place across more than 80 centres 
in the UK and is quite complex and the governance is quite complex, the funding is quite complex, so you need a big team. Nice. Maybe we can bring those two talks together. Um, and the, the term complementary was mentioned by you um, in, in terms of how real-world data could potentially inform randomized control trials. And I wonder if there's a practical example of how RCTs can inform real-world data collection and vice versa. That's a good question. And I'll let Gary answer that <laughs> one first. You touched on emulated designs. Mm. So, um, I mean, we, we have been thinking about this and I have to say that most of the examples that I can give you just now are where in observational data we have been able to replicate the results from trials, knowing, knowing the results from, uh, from trials. But let, let me give you an example of something that, we're, that we are working um, uh, towards is that uh, we know, for example, in chronic pain that, um, that exercise is beneficial and we've been able to replicate that in observational studies. Um, we are now looking towards the different types of, I mean, what exercise for patients, say, with fibromyalgia is most, is most beneficial? Uh, so building on the results from trials and observational data, here's a question that we can really only answer in observational data, because I don't think um, I don't think we could get funding for a mm. trial that was mm. looking at different types of exercise, where the differences are likely to be quite small. So the trial has to be quite big, and and therefore for very expensive. So I don't I don't think that's directly answered your question, but it's giving you an idea about how we are using the data from trials and then trying to build on it with observational studies. Another example would be looking at combination. Uh, management, which um, is again quite complex through trials, and well, it's certainly time consuming, mm -hmm. and you may have many questions about different combinations. It just wouldn't be practical to do with trials. I don't know if I have anything to add um, to that, but what comes to mind, um, and you're talking about RCTs informing um, observational data. Um, studies and results. What comes to mind is actually the other way, what other way around, like the Zealand designs, for example. So you have, um, let's say, a cohort of um, patients with acute back pain and you follow them up and once they become chronic, you randomize them to one or the other. So, so it's slightly different. I think it really depends on, on your question, right? If you're trying to establish a causal relationship between intervention and outcome, I don't really see how you can do it apart from um, in a randomized trial, um, but, but maybe, yeah. I was just thinking about kind of registry data and service evaluation and quality assurance and audit, because it seems to me that, that, that quite a lot of national data is used to look at quality and then make causal inferences about a lack of quality and performance and then to do interventions. I'm just sort of, you know, staggered by the subtlety of the analysis. I'm just, you know, it's just making me thinking about, you know, big, big problems database mm -hmm. bases and how those are used. And I'm just thinking, you know, is that good? Is that bad? Are the high risks there? Yeah. So, I mean, as with almost everything, Stephen, there's the good and the bad. I mean, it does allow us opportunities that we, we haven't had before, the, the, uh, the opportunities with big data and particularly around record linkage. But there's also risks um, as well. So let me give you an example. I am, I am one of the um, uh, hanging editors of uh, a prominent rheumatology journal and papers come in and very quickly you decide whether they're going out for review. One of the things that we're finding is we're getting lots of papers from big databases. Mm -hmm. But how many associations did they have to look at with back pain until they found the one that was significant? So, for example, I was just reading before I came here today, there's a paper been published showing that eating dried fruit puts you at higher risk of back pain. I mean... Thank God it's not in my diet. What a relief. <laughs> um, so, um, 
I think we also have to change the way we do science. So, so things, for example, like publishing protocols in advance and say, actually, I'm interested in this sector. Here's the rationale and here's the analysis that I'm going to do and depositing that. Then you do your paper and then it's quite clear that there was that um, approach. But there is a danger of going on what we call a fishing expedition. Mm -hmm. And if you think there could be something like 200 exposure variables, various outcome variables, you know, there will be lots of things that come up, up by chance. So, so that's, so, you know, lots of opportunities, but lots of dangers as well. well I, th I think on the dried fruit note, <laughs> we probably have hit lunchtime. Thank you very much for coming, everybody, and thank you very much for the, the speakers.